Jeremiah. And tonight we're going from chapter 4, verse number 3, all the way through chapter 5, verse number 2. Um, but our scripture reading is going to be a little more condensed uh, than that. And so I'll just go ahead and start reading and then we'll just follow along. I'll make mention as to where we skip to. Um, verse number 3 of chapter number 4. For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground, and sow not among thorns. Circumcise that yourselves to the Lord, and take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Lest my fury come forth like fire, and burn that none can quench it, because of the evil of your doings. Declare ye in Judah, and publish in Jerusalem, and say, Blow ye the trumpet in the land, cry, gather together, and say, Assemble yourselves, and let us go into the defense cities. Set up the standard toward Zion, retire, stay not, for I will bring evil from the north, and a great destruction. The lion is come up from his thicket, and the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. He has gone forth from his place to make thy land desolate, and thy cities shall be laid waste without an inhabitant. For this, gird you your, with sackcloth, lament, and howl, for the fierce anger of the Lord is not turned back from us. And it shall come to pass at that day, saith the Lord, that the heart of the king shall perish, and the heart of the princes and the priests shall be astonished, and the prophets shall wander. Now turn with me to chapter number 5, verses 1 through 2. Chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. In verse number 1, it says, Run ye to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem, and see now, and know, and seek in the broad places thereof, if ye can find a man, if there be any that executeth judgment, that seeketh the truth, and I will pardon it. And though they say, The Lord liveth, surely they swear falsely. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing on the time we have together. Father, we thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to understand your word. Help us, guide us through this wonderful passage, and help us to take to heart the lessons you have in store for us. And may you help me as I speak and help all of our hearts be acceptive to the attentive to the uh, message that you have for us. We ask you to be glorified in this message right now. I do pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me ask you, what first comes to mind? And you can answer. That's, that's good to answer. This morning you couldn't. This morning, tonight you can. So what comes to mind first off, right off the bat, when you hear the word sense of urgency? What comes to mind? Sense of urgency. Super important. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Anybody else? It needs to be done ASAP, as soon as possible. All right. All right. Anything else? Yes, Timo. Hurricane. Okay. Okay. So it's an interesting thing about hurricanes in that you do have some lead time. You still do have some time to procrastinate if you dare to do so, or you have time to exit the uh, Florida state if you really want to go that route. Um, but tornadoes, I would say, is a little more of an urgent to get into a shelter. Uh, if you hear tornado sirens, where tornado sirens are usually there in the Midwest, I, I, I have my thoughts uh, towards, then you need to get inside as soon as possible. The sense of urgency with a tornado, it's a lot more. Uh, but yeah, a sense of urgency with a hurricane, especially if tomorrow is coming. Yeah, and especially if you're not prepared, that's a problem. <laughs> and so what you would see at the... Uh, in the, at Walmart or any store is bare um, rows of, of things. As there's nothing there. There's no, there's forget water. Yeah, you're not going to find any. It's, it's not going to be there. Uh, so yeah, sense of urgency everybody has. Anybody else? Any other thoughts? School shooting? Yeah, that's definitely a sense of urgency. We saw a few weeks back with uh, 
with one Christian school that got targeted and the sense of urgency of those police officers going in and taking out uh, the person at, at, uh, at large. And so, yes, absolutely. So we see a sense of urgency. Yes, Pastor. Okay, okay, time is of the essence in a contract. Oh, huh. okay, so don't drag your feet. <laughs> okay, judge duty, all right. <laughs> oh, good friend, that's good, that's good. Judah. Okay, somebody dying at the hospital. Yep, there's a sense of urgency to get to that person. There's a couple things that I think of right off the bat. One is immediate just because it was so um, so in front of me. And, and so before I became the pastor, I was at South Lake Hospital. I, was, I worked there as the supervisor of the food service. That sounds a lot more glamorous than what it was. And it was uh, at this point in time uh, that uh, it was right at this point in time that I was about to become the senior pastor. And they asked me, could you prolong it a little bit? We are in the midst of of a um, redoing the entire kitchen. So what would have to be done is we take the entire kitchen from South Lake Hospital and go outside over yonder where there's a prepared couple trailers for with all the food and with all the things that you needed, all the, all the refrigerators, all the burners, all, everything. Everything's in these two trailers that are off yonder. And so what my director installed in all of us sense of urgency so the person will have to be there and they're making all the trays they're making all the trays doing all this and then they push the cart all the way down the ramp over here and then they're going over here they're going over to the hospital itself so they enter the code and they, they go in then they run up to this the floor where the ambassador would be there to take all the trays and, and give them to all the patients. And then that person would come all the way back, all the way over, and back over here to the trailers. Whew. And then they have to do the same thing a few different times. And these are not, uh, these are not uh, just like 10 trays. There are at least 20 trays per, per cart. And so over and over, and I got to know those trailers very, very well. Sense of urgency. And I timed it as soon as I could get from the trailer all the way to the hospital and uh, going to all the different floors and then coming all the way back to the trailer. It took me about, about 30 to 45 minutes to do every single thing about, about going about it. Like, wow, Whew. that was a sense of urgency. And then one time I had not enough people. So people called out and I said, huh, how is this going to work? Well, I had to make the trays, put them in the cart, then I had to go and do the same exact thing, and then I was not as quick, though, as everything, and then my manager came, and then we tried to tag team it together, then she was called away, then I, okay, I'm, I'm going to have to do this, and I have to figure out some other possibility for this. So, sense of urgency was quite there. And so, the amazing thing, sense of urgency. I always remember that time as that time of, okay, you, 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 you don't have enough time to take a breath, basically. You, you don't have enough time. Uh, you have to do stuff all the time in that scenario. Now, praise Lord, they have their new kitchen. And now the problem, because I was just there a couple of weeks ago talking with, uh, visiting the chef, and what's the problem? <laughs> no, <laughs> it's not just the same old food. Though the problem is that they have just, they're getting ready to um, finish a construction project that has given a hundred more beds. <laughs> and so Chef told me, he's like, yeah, we have to reconfigure the tray line because this is not going to work for a hundred more beds and still doing it at two trays per minute and so yeah sense of urgency they have to refigure the um, kitchen once again in order to get everything to work right so that's one thing i, I think of sense of urgency 
But the other one is a lot more serious. Um, it is the story of John Harper. I don't know if any of you know John Harper by name. And in fact, uh, he's not very famous whatsoever nowadays. Um, but hearing the name John Harper, uh, for anybody that uh, it, you know, knows a little bit about history, John Harper was a pastor, a very influential pastor in Scotland. And uh, he decided to um, go to um, speak at the Moody Bible Institute, so the Moody Church there in Chicago. Well, he decided to take his family, and uh, so at that point, he only had his, his daughter, which was six years old, and then he had his niece with him, and so they decided to book a passage across uh, the Atlantic from, from uh, Scotland to, to uh, the New, uh, New York City, and um, everything was hunky-dory until all of a sudden they felt a shudder. John figured out from the stewardess that they just hit an iceberg. And so John went to his, his family's room and said, we need to get up and we need to get ready because we just hit an iceberg. I don't know what's going on, and I'm going to find out what we need to do. So he goes off, finds out that, okay, women and children are being um, put on board the ships, on the lifeboats. And so he goes back, takes his, his child and his niece, all the way to the boat deck and puts him on a life, um, a life raft. And so he then disappears, never to be seen of again from his daughter. But he, through many people's um, eyewitness accounts, he then goes from his daughter being put into a lifeboat to go and to spread the word of Jesus Christ. He preached the gospel numerous times to everybody that's still on board the Titanic. And so he preached, and he preached. One person came over to him and said, I don't believe a word you're saying. And then so John takes off his life vest and says, here, you're going to need this more than I will. And so he gives it to that guy, and, and we never know if he sees him again. But he preaches and preaches and preaches. Then all of a sudden, the ship, it you know, cracks into two. It's going under. He jumps off the Titanic into the water, swims away from the, from the ship that's going now underneath the water. And now he is in freezing cold temperatures, holding on, dear life, uh, to pieces of the ship. And he's going from person to person, swimming to each and every person, asking them if they know Christ, if they know Christ, if they know Christ. And then eventually this one person he said specifically that he came, that John came to him and, and gave him the gospel, and this person said, I don't, I don't want that. And so, okay, he swims off to the next person. Next person, eventually he comes back, almost dead, and he asks him one last time, do you want to receive Christ? And he says, yes, I do. And so he received Christ as his own personal Savior. Um, John, um, he died, John Harper died of hypothermia just like many people there in that uh, tragedy. No, it's actually 111 years ago yesterday. So just thinking about that. He had a sense of urgency that he knew that time was short. From the very time that uh, the iceberg, that they hit the iceberg, they had two hours and 40 minutes before the ship would be under the water. And so sense of urgency John Harper had. And so he never made it to New York. He never spoke at uh, Moody Church. Um, and I even read in an article that he was supposed to become the pastor of Moody Church um, when he came. Um, but yet that never happened. Now what happened in the meantime is that his daughter was then looked after, back, going back to Scotland. They was looked after with an uncle and aunt. She grew up married a, a Christian young man. That man became the pastor of a Baptist church there in Scotland, and they had a wonderful life together. It, they, she doesn't talk about the Titanic too much because of the bad imagery that it brought forth. Sense of urgency. If we knew that we were on a ship going down, and the people on board, they were either going to heaven or to hell, most likely they were going to hell, 
what kind of sense of urgency would we have? Here in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah has an immense sense of urgency because something is coming and we're going to investigate what. So first of all, notice with me what it says here. Uh, the people themselves are being proclaimed to that they need to get right with God. That's the first point, is that the people are being proclaimed to by Jeremiah that they need to get right with God. Notice with me in verse number 3. For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem. Now, stop right there. Right before this point, it was talk, he was specifically talking to that of the people of Israel, the northern nation of Israel. Now we're going to very closely to where he lives, to Jerusalem, to the people of, Ju of Judah, specifically the men of Judah. And verse number four, circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. Now, if you don't remember, if, or if you're new to this study, uh, Jeremiah was at a specific point in time where Judah was, well, unfortunately, stuck with idolatry. They would worship all these different gods, gods of the lands. And in fact, God specifically mentions that the people have been worshiping other gods over every single hill there is in Judah. That's a lot of gods. That's a lot of altars to one that's not God. And so they've been doing this over and over and over again. And on top of that, the people have been doing other crimes, other sins before God. And so now time is of the essence and that they are going to be judged. Time is of the essence. Right now, it's an interesting point where Jeremiah is, is speaking because the beginning of his ministry is with a wonderful, righteous king, King Josiah. In fact, he is, according to what Scripture says, the best king that, is, that Judah has ever had even before him or after him, he is the best king in the history of Judah and Israel. What a, a what an amazing uh, way of describing a person, isn't it? Better than David. What, weird to think about that. Better than Solomon. Weird to think about. And of course, the other ones, they don't hold a candle to Josiah because Josiah was so much about seeking the Lord. He became king when he was eight years old. That's pretty young to become a king. But yet he sought the Lord. All throughout his life he sought the Lord. When the law came in, into understanding that they have the law now, it was read to Josiah. Josiah trembled at the word of God. And then demonstrated how humble he was that he ran his clothes and he prayed. And he prayed diligently asking for God's wrath not to come against his kingdom. And so, message was came from the word of the Lord and basically said, well, judgment is going to happen. But, because of your righteousness, it will be stayed for until you are out of the way. Until you die, then it will be stayed. But then after you're gone, it'll come. And right to the point in time that Josiah is off the scene, his kids take over, and unfortunately, things go haywire very quickly. So notice with me what it says here, how much of an uh, emergency, sense of urgency that Jeremiah has. Verse number five, declare ye in Judah, publish in Jerusalem, and say, blow ye the trumpet in the land, cry and gather together and say, assemble yourselves and let us go into the defense cities. Set up the standard toward Jerusalem. Retire, stay not, for I will bring evil from the north and a great destruction. The lion has come up from his thicket, and the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. He has gone forth from his place to make thy land desolate, and thy cities shall be laid waste without an inhabitant. For this gird you with sackcloth, lament and howl, for the fierce anger of the Lord is not turned back from us. 
Jeremiah knows that judgment is imminent. He knows that uh, what it says, the lion is coming. He is coming out of his thicket. The destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. What a description of this person. Now, we know from other scriptures and we know from history what eventually happens. This man is named Nebuchadnezzar. He is the king of Babylon. He becomes king of Babylon, and he comes with all of his army. Now, true enough, Babylon is not quite north, but what happens is that he has to go up to north, to the north, in order to come back down to get to Jerusalem. And so that's exactly what happens historically. Nebuchadnezzar is this lion. Nebuchadnezzar is this destroyer of the Gentiles. And he is the one that is going to be used by God to deliver judgment against his own people. Now, think about this. For those who are here on Wednesday night, we talked about that of Solomon and his dedication to his dedication prayer to, about the temple of the Lord. Everybody's so secure about the temple is there in Jerusalem. The amazing temple of Solomon. It's overlaid mostly with gold. It must be an absolute amazing sight to behold. We had a little bit of a, a taste of that at the uh, Holy Land experience here in Orlando. It's no longer there. But uh, we had a little taste of it. We saw it, uh, the temple. But yet, even that, it was a little, you know, we could tell it's not real, but okay. Um, but yet, just the amazing brilliance of that place, it blinded you. I didn't wear sunglasses when we went, so it blinded me. I'm like, okay, it's very, very bright because the sun just hits it, and wow, it's nothing but, but light you could see. How much more is that of Jerusalem? How much more than that is Solomon's temple that he built? But yet, God says in talking with Solomon and regarding his prayer, it says, if, you're, if the people reject me, if they forsake me, I will forsake this temple. I will forsake the place that I put my name there. I will, do, I will destroy this temple. And lo and behold, he, he lets Nebuchadnezzar come in and destroy, wipe out this temple because of the sins of the people. A sense of urgency for these people. Now, this people, if they truly turned to the Lord and sought him out and uh, put away their wickedness in front of their eyes, if they put away their, their gaunts that they had on every single hill that you have in, Jer in Judah, if they did that, God would have mercy for a time period. I am convinced that he would have called off Nebuchadnezzar to do something else, but yet eventually he will come back. Now, they could be for one generation be saved if they turned to God. We see that with, uh, with Jonah, with that of uh, Nineveh, even though he didn't want to go. Nineveh, the Ninevites turned to God for that generation, and they were saved from the wrath of God. But then you fast forward to another uh, minor prophet, and judgment is now. I believe it's Nahum that it's the prophet against Nineveh, that it, this, is going to, this city is going to be destroyed. They had the right response with Jonah, but later on with that of Nahum, okay, now is the time. God's wrath is against you, and there's nothing that put it back because they would not accept God's um, his word on the, on the address of their wickedness. So here we see the same thing with Judah. The nation of Judah is heading towards judgment. The nation of Judah is not doing the things that they ought to be doing. Uh, they are not turning from their sins. They're not turning to God, but rather the punisher is coming. But then we see an amazing thing happen that not just the problem outside of them, but we see really the problem within. Notice with me what it says there in, in verse number 16 of chapter 4. In verse number 16, it says, Make ye mention to the nations, behold, publish against Jerusalem, that watchers come from a far country and give out their voice against the cities of Judah as, the, as keepers of a field, and they turn uh, they, they against her round about, because she hath been rebellious against me, saith the Lord. 
Thy way and thy doings have procured these things unto thee. This is thy wickedness, because it is better, because it reacheth, reacheth unto thine heart. He says of the people of Judah that you deserve this judgment. Your wickedness is, is in your heart, and you have not turned away from it. You are a rebellious people. You have not turned back to God. Such an amazing thing against these people. And then we, we see beyond that, uh, verse number 27, what we see is going to behold this entire land. Verse 27, for thus hath the Lord said, the whole land shall be desolate, yet will I not make a full end. For this shall the earth mourn, and the heavens above be black, because I have spoken, and I have purposed it, and will not repent, neither will I turn back from it. The whole city shall flee, flee for, for the noise of the horsemen and bowmen. They shall go into thickets and climb up upon the rocks. Every city shall be forsaken, and not a man dwell therein. And when thou art spoiled, what wilt thou do? Though thou clothest thyself with crimson, though thou deckest thyself with ornaments of gold, though thou rentest thy face with paintings, in vain shalt thou make thyself fear. Thy lovers will despise thee, they will seek thy life. For I have heard a voice as of a woman in travail, and the anguish as of her that bringeth forth her first child, the voice of the daughter of Zion that bewaileth herself, that spreadeth her hands, saying, Woe is me now, for my soul is wearied because of murderers. He says specifically, your land is going to be desolate. Now, this morning when, when Bruce was talking about, uh, talking about the, the nation of Judah, he did reference the, the fact that the reason why they go into captivity is because they did not keep the Sabbath year. So in the nation of Israel, what was supposed to happen is that six years they would work the land, work the land, work the land, and then the seventh year they would take a Shabbat. They would take a rest of the land. They wouldn't work the land whatsoever. But yet God would bless them if they did so. Well, they never did so. So 490 years of not doing it. Now you have 70 years of captivity. And exactly to the point in time that they go into captivity to Daniel's prayer, we have that of 70 years. It's an amazing figure. It's an amazing way of God saying this is what is right, and he's going to do exactly his righteousness on the land. And so the nation of Judah it has a problem. And it's that of sin. And then not only that, but notice with me what happens. Verse number 1 of chapter 5. Run ye to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem, and see now, and know, and seek in the broad places thereof, if ye can find a man, if there be any that executeth judgment, that seeketh the truth, and I will pardon it. And though they say, the Lord liveth, surely they swear falsely. Now here we see that God says, okay, Jeremiah, go and run. Run throughout all the people that are there. See if you can find any person, any man that will actually do what I have told them to do. And I will pardon it. I will pardon the land. It's kind of like that of uh, Abraham, you know, talking with the Lord and saying about the city of Sodom. Okay, for, for 50, would you spare him for 50 righteous people? Okay, for 50, I'll, I'll, I'll spare him. How about 45? Yeah, I'll, I'll spare him for 45. 40? 30? 20? 10? He should have said one. No, because <laughs> there was only one righteous person in the, in the entire city of Sodom, and it was Lot. His daughters didn't say that they, that they were righteous, but rather Lot was the righteous Lot. He was just Lot. We see that he was in the city of Sodom, unfortunately, and the city was going to have judgment. Angels couldn't do anything to the city until Lot was taken out of the way. So here we see that God is still just in all that he does. He says to Jeremiah, find me a man and I will pardon it, and he can't. Because what they say, verse number two, 
though they say the Lord liveth, surely they swear falsely. Not that the Lord actually does live, because he liveth. Amen. He is ever living. He, that's what the name Lord or Jehovah or Yahweh means. He ever lives. He cannot die. He cannot be unexisting, if that is a word that I could use. Um, but no, what they say is, oh, the Lord liveth, and really they go after other gods. They're like, okay, yeah, I, I'm, I'm walking with the Lord, but I'm going to worship this idol over here. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm walking with the Lord. I'm, I'm doing all the things. I'm doing the law. And don't worry. I'm just going to be over here and worship the idol. They, he, they are being warmed all throughout the book of Jeremiah. Uh, one commentator said that throughout the book of Jeremiah, there's 40 different times where Jeremiah warns them of the coming judgment. 40 different times. You know, if God says something once, that's good enough for me. But if he says it twice, well, that's something uh, that's really important. Three times, very important. 40 times. Well, okay, I think he's, he means what he says. So he warns them 40 times of coming judgment, and yet they do not listen to him. For us, sense of urgency. For us, we have a little bit a different point in time, but yet still the reality is there. America is not in the prophecies in the Old Testament. I want to throw that out there. At least not to my understanding. It could be there. I just don't, I don't see it there. But what the principles about Israel in the Old Testament, as well as if a nation seeks after God, then God will probably bless that nation. And I say probably, and that he will. Okay, God is just. He will bless the nation that seeks after him. America has sought after God from before the beginning with the first great awakening. Jonathan Edwards, wonderful uh, preacher, pastor, J George Whitfield, also there uh, at the first awakening. And then we have the second awakening and all that. Well, America has not sought God's face. And now we get so many issues going on with the news going on these days. For instance, there's confusion in the land. People are just doing things that do not make sense whatsoever. And our economy is not quite what it used to be, as we can attest to inflation. And how much, you know, Laura said, oh, this cost us this much a couple years ago, and now this cost us this much. I'm like, wow, that's, that's almost double the price. Amazing how that goes. And then not only that, we have uh, enemies in the world that are making more and more weapons that are making us a little uncomfortable with what they're doing, that of China, that of Russia, just doing a lot of different things. That's kind of, hmm, perhaps with all the things going on in America today, perhaps because of all the weird um, weather phenomenon going in America today, perhaps time it's time for America to wake up and to seek the Lord. There is still that sense of urgency for us as believers that we need to spread the gospel. What we need to do is be the light in this dark, wicked place so that people can turn from their wicked ways and seek the Lord. That is our sense of urgency. We need to have a sense of urgency about us that we are going to be right with God no matter what it costs us. We need to have a sense of urgency for us that we are going to give up any sin that, is, that we habitually go to, that we enjoy. We'll give up those sins because we want to get close to God. That sense of urgency, that time is now. Christ can appear in the clouds at any point in time. And for all of us, if we just have this sense of urgency about his return, because yes, it can come at any, if, if he comes before I say amen today, that will be amazing. That will be wonderful. And we know that time is up for this time period. But yet, if we wake up tomorrow morning and he's not here, there's time for us to do his will. There is time and we need a sense of urgency 
for us to get close to God, a sense of urgency for us to pray and pray for the lost. One amazing thing about John Harper on the Titanic is that he, many people gave witness as to his character, and they said that he, they never knew a man that prayed as hard for the lost as John Harper did. They would say of times where he is praying for hours on end for the lost people, him with tears in his eyes coming running down to his folded hands. He is praying for the lost. He even prayed, Lord, give me sinners to get saved or just let me die. And so he passed away on the Titanic, rather in the frigid, cold Atlantic water. But the sense of urgency that he had that we all need to have. So I hope this has helped us to have that sense of urgency, knowing that the time is now. If we're going to serve the Lord, let's do it now. Don't wait for any future event to happen in, in the future because, hey, it might not be there. The time is now. We need that sense of urgency, the sense of urgency to pray fervently for the lost. We need a sense of urgency that we would take care of every opportunity we have that we can minister, that we can um, evangelize to people that might not know the way is Christ. And so that sense of urgency is for each and every one of us if we just take a hold of that. Oh, how different this world will be. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this evening you have given us. We ask you to help us with that sense of urgency. Help us and guide us to be about your business. Help us to leave the temporal things of this earth, the things that might so easily hinder our walk with you. And may we be consecrated before you. Help us to know you better. Help us to be fervent in our prayers for the lost, as well as for each other. May you encourage us. May you help us to be the witnesses we ought to be. I do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you take your